I'm Max. Uh, you might remember me from such classics as the uh, General Assembly Web Development Immersive Program, their SQL Boot Camp. Um, I'm a tech industry wanderer. I've done a little bit of everything. Uh, I've been programming for countless millennia, <sighs> around 20 years, I think. Um, I have gone from uh, writing code for Fortune 500s and uh, independent game developers to more recently education, uh, classroom teaching, project management. Um, I love Vim. It's not easy to use. I love Vim anyway. <laughs> um, so I, uh, I wanted to put together this talk because, well, here. So let me, actually, let me skip to this first. So the goals of this talk uh, are not to hate on plugins or get people to stop using them. Uh, the goals of this talk are to increase the understanding of Vim and to offer options. Um, because if you don't know something's out there, then how do you know if you should even look into it, right? Um, I firmly believe that understanding our tools is one of the most important and kind of overlooked uh, priorities for a lot of technology, not just development, but like life in general. Understanding the thing that you're working with, uh, it does a lot. And I think that especially uh, nowadays with the emphasis on um, like these fast boot camps that uh, get you into the world in like three months or, or two weeks, um, it can be really easy to lose track of what it is you're actually trying to do and figure out. And I think that if you find a balance between, sure, get a plug-in going, let it do stuff for you, don't worry about it, and take a little while to dive in to your tool that you already have, which is Vim, and look around and figure out what's going on, that's where you really get into powerful programming and uh, incredibly fast and efficient work. And that's good for everybody. So here's what we're going to go through. Oh, just one more note before I dive in on how to follow along. Uh, this is a terminal screen, which will remain on screen for uh, hopefully the entire talk. Um, I'm using a, a little terminal window manager sort of thing called Tmux. And what you're seeing down here, uh, you can just sit, think of this as like a tab list. So if this one's dark, that means I'm on this tab. If this one's dark, that means I'm uh, in the tab where I've configured my Vim specially. And here's where I have a vanilla Vim. So I'm going to be switching back and forth a lot. And the reason will be I'm going to show uh, how to configure Vim to do the stuff that plugins can do, uh, what it looks like when you haven't done that, and what it looks like once you have configured it. And I have also uh, built the slides out of uh, a VimRC file. I've never presented this way before, but it seemed kind of cool. So if we're lucky, it'll completely fall apart, and you'll get to see me wing it. <laughs> OK. <clears throat> yes. Good looking out. <laughs> uh, so first, I'm going to be talking about fuzzy file search. Uh, this is a really cool one that requires very little configuration and lets you go really, really fast. There are several plugins for this, like Command T, Command P, Fuzzy Find. Um, they all do pretty similar stuff, but you can get a surprising amount of mileage out of just Vim. After that, I'll do tag jumping. Uh, tags, if you're not familiar with the concept, uh, is like anything that's important to your programming language. So if you make a class called abstract, then abstract is a tag. And if you use it someplace else, you might want to be able to jump to it really quickly without having to dive down and figure out exactly what file it's in. Uh, there are plugins for this too. I forget all of their names, but Vim can do it out of the box. Uh, almost. Next, uh, autocomplete, everyone's favorite. Um, there are plenty of options for autocomplete in Vim. Um, in many of these situations, I actually have come to use plugins uh, instead. Uh, let's see, for file browsing, even I use a nerd tree now, and I don't use a lot of plugins. But autocomplete is one of those things where I see a ton of plugins for, and it just surprises me because Vim can do so much just by itself. So that'll be a really fun one. Um, after that, I uh, will do file browsing with Vim's cantankerous but functional built-in file browser called NetRW. Uh, we'll go into snippets, which will be a pretty quick one. And finally, if we have some time, I'll talk about build integration, which is um, when you want to run your tests and get immediate output or be able to jump between all the errors that happen. Uh, Vim can do that too. It's quite cool. Uh, OK, so before I get started, does anyone have any questions about anything on the list? Anything super surprising to you? Cool. I always like to check. 
So this is, uh, again, in the form of a VimRC file. Uh, in practice, you can go to the GitHub repo and just copy paste the lines that you're interested in to yours. Uh, these are the only um, global configuration changes necessary to make this stuff work. Uh, no compatible, just tells Vim to not bother pretending to be its predecessor, uh, Vi, V. I don't know how you're supposed to pronounce the one without the M. But Vi's super old, and by default, Vim tries to act like it because it assumes that you've been doing this for 50 years and you fear change. Um, sorry if I just offended anybody. <laughs> uh, Sorry, not sorry. So uh, after that, uh, just syntax uh, enabled to allow some uh, nice colors on the screen for us. And finally, uh, file type plugin on, kind of cheating, a little bit. Uh, the feature that's built into Vim that uses, uh, that it uses for file browsing, it, technically it's a plugin, but it comes with Vim, so I kind of don't think of it as one. Um, you could probably have a really long debate on that, but I'm not gonna do that. <laughs> so first, uh, let's talk about finding files. <clears throat> Now, the interesting thing about this is there is no Vim feature that's called like fuzzy file finder. Um, it's kind of just this accident of various other features that it has bumping into each other in just the right ways that you can do all the things that I'm about to do. Uh, and it all starts with this one humble option. Uh, if you're not familiar with uh, Vim configuration syntax or Vim in general, I'm just going to do a really quick like one sentence pitch on it. Um, set is a command that changes a built-in uh, configuration variable such as path and uh, plus equals means append it to the existing value of path because there's a default and two stars means something very important. Uh, now one of the things I'm going to be doing occasionally in this talk is jumping to the Vim uh, help system which is actually one of the most complex but really thorough and nicely built help systems that I think exists. Um, you can read pretty much anything by, uh, uh, you can figure out pretty much anything by reading through these and a lot of the stuff that I'm going to show today uh, are things that I found just by stumbling on them uh, in the documentation. I mean it's kind of a shame that you have to uh, read the documentation for fun to figure some of this stuff out but hey that's why I'm giving the talk. <laughs> So uh, this is a list of directories which will be searched when using any of these commands. So these are all file-related commands. And down uh, deep in the depths of this documentation, they actually explain uh, what star star does, but I'm having trouble remembering where it is, so I'm just going to tell you what it does. Star star tells it to, uh, when you look for a file, search through every subdirectory, and search through every subdirectory of every subdirectory. and so. This is what my folder structure looks like right now. So this is a project that I uh, have had in the back burner for a while. It's a little uh, text-based game, the server side. And I have this deeply nested file here, like tcp.rb. And I'm going to be running Vim in this folder. Uh, there are a lot of um, tips and tricks and tweaks that suggest adding something to your configuration so that your current folder follows whichever file you're looking at. Like if you're looking at TCP or RB, then Vim's folder gets switched here. But I never do that because if you leave your Vim's active directory at the root of your project, then it can do these special recursive searches, uh, such as with the star star in your path, and it can reach into all the different files and folders that you have. So I'm going to show you what that looks like. First, if I go to my vanilla Vim instance and I try to find that file, say find tcp.rb. Uh, oh, I guess I loaded in the real one, sorry. <laughs> uh, there we go. Oh, that's not how you do it anymore. Okay, screw the vanilla one. <laughs> so uh, you'll have to trust that that doesn't work if you don't set the path. Uh, but I'm going to do a little sanity check and make sure that the variable looks the way I expect. So we can see uh, here are all the defaults. Um, mysteriously, someone added nothing a couple times, but here's the two asterisks that I put in. <laughs> ah, software. <laughs> so here's the thing. Uh, not only can I find TCPRB, can I please just like get it to do the thing? There we go. Find TCPRB. 
So I just jumped immediately to that file, uh, even though it was not in my current working directory. What's great about this as well is if I say find TCP and tab, it will complete that for me. So once again, that's TCP tab. It found it way down in the folder structure. Uh, you can also use basic pattern recognition like star CP. I think this should work. There you go. So if you want to make it fuzzy, you just put a star. You can put it at the beginning or the end, and you're good to go. Um, so hopefully this is a nice start to sort of the big splash of using Vim without plugins. Uh, this does, I'm not crazy, right? Like this is like most of what a lot of fuzzy finders do, right? <laughs> okay. Uh, I think it's really cool that Vim can just do that. Um, it's sort of a shame that it's, I mean, I don't understand really why that's not default behavior because that's really useful, but who knows? <laughs> um, the other thing I changed was this uh, thing called wild menu. And basically, when you look for uh, a file and it has several, uh, there's several different things that could match. Like let's say I just want to look for all the RB files. So I'm going to say find star.rb. Now when I hit tab, it's actually going to um, put all of the possible RB files it can find. And I can just sort through them with shift tab and tab. And I can just pick the one that I want. Uh, so you can configure this wild menu thing a number of different ways. But just by activating it uh, by default, you get that neat little menu thing here. And that gives you just pretty much like a, a biggest bang for your buck, I think, in terms of fuzzy file finding compared to those plugins. Um, one other thing to consider, if you already have a file open, and that means essentially in Vim, if you've ever opened the file, you can type this command ls, and it will give you a list of what Vim calls buffers, which are basically just files it's holding in memory that you may or may not be currently looking at. So if I open up another file, for example, what's a, what's a good file? I'll open up world.rb. That sounds pretty interesting. So I have these two files open now, and if I type ls, here they both are. The important thing about this is that if you already have a file open like this, you can jump to it just by typing colon b space and typing in a unique subset of its file name. So I can just say btcp. I don't have to hit tab. I don't have to do anything. But if you give the b command a, uh, what's, the, what's the programmery term, a substring uh, that is unique to one of the files you have open, it'll just jump to it right away. And if it's not unique, it'll tell you more than one match. And in that case, you can just do the tab complete thing and it will scroll through suggestions for you. So between find and the buffer command, B is short for buffer, uh, you can do a whole lot with navigation uh, without really needing any other dependencies. And that's super cool. Any questions about this one? Yeah? Is there any way to find and ignore certain file types or directories? Uh, so uh, the question was, is there a way to ignore certain files or file types? That's a great question. Uh, off the top of my head, I don't know. Um, I bet that somewhere in the um, bowels of the find man page, it might explain. Uh, good question, though. Any others before I move on? Yep. And then you? Is the tab always showing the vertical recursive uh, search, or is it so that when you tab through that? Uh, uh, I'm not sure what you're asking just yet. To open the file, opening the file is always recursive if you give it the star star. Yes, so the question was, is the find always recursive? And uh, the star star is in the actual path variable. So like, I don't have to type it in again ever. Uh, I, the only time I might type an asterisk is going to be if I want to find uh, some file that I have open, or some file that I haven't opened yet, uh, based on part of its name. So like, if I wanted to open up a spec, then I might say star spec. But um, this asterisk and these two asterisks are doing very different things. Um, this one is very specific to like this one search that I'm running right now. I'm saying find any file that starts with, or, or that ends with spec. Um, and hitting tab there, that'll scroll through. And this search is always recursive because of those two asterisks. Yeah. So the path command configures how all the file-based commands work. Uh, there is, but you'd have to probably mess with um, the path variable, or you would have to specifically type it into your search. 
So I might say find, uh, let's see, what folder was that in? I might say find lib tella star.rb. And so now I've, I've explicitly told this search to say only show me things in that folder. Um, does that answer your question? Yes. Awesome. Thank you. And I think there was one more, possibly? Yeah, that partially addressed it, but just to confirm, so the star star means you're only going too deep. The, like, too many, too many folders deep? Yeah. Yeah. Um, if, you, if you do have a ton of folders, then you might find a slowdown. But uh, I think you'd have to, you'd probably have to uh, have quite a few. Because I've used this on some pretty hairy projects, and it's only the, like, 20-year-old, 20 20-million-line 20 code base <laughs> situations where it actually starts to chug. So it's pretty impressively fast, in my experience. Uh, is, that, is that what you were thinking about? Yeah, yeah. okay. Um, I think I saw some other questions, possibly, but I do want to keep moving along. If we have time at the end, um, I'll be happy to cover some more, though. Okay. Oh, that's not where I have my slides. So next up is tag jumping. This one requires uh, an extra tool called ctags. So once again, a tag is any interesting word or a collection of alphanumerics that you might want to um, navigate to or find quickly. If I'm moving through my code base like this, and let's see. What's a good tag that I defined myself? Oh, these were, this is all deep stuff that has no dependency that I made. All right, here we go. So let's say I'm looking through my code base and I see this thing called exit, and I want to know what that is. Where is it defined? What does it do? What's the source code? Um, if you are unable to jump and navigate by tags, then there isn't really an easy way of doing this besides like changing over to your terminal and grepping for it or using some kind of IDE feature. Um, the tool that I'm going to be using is called ctags. Uh, it I think exists by default on every uh, modern GNU Linux system. Uh, you have to brew install it or find it some other way on OS X. Um, if anyone is unfamiliar with brew or homebrew, uh, just let me know afterwards and I'll help you get set up. Um, the exclamation point causes this to run as a shell command. So I'm, uh, I'm asking Vim, when I type in make tags, just pretend I type this into the console. So for the sake of simplicity, um, I'm going to type it into the console myself. So C tags, dash capital R, which means recursive. This is effectively uh, the C tags version of that star star. It just means drill down into all possible folders and dot. And in classic uh, Unixy style, no news means good news. If I look at LS now, I have a file that was not there before called tags. And it is a super fugly, confusing list of stuff that it found. But here's what it lets you do. Now that there's a file called tags in the current directory, Vim is configured to automatically look at that specific file name. Uh, at least I think that's the default. OK, so this is its list of places to look for tags. Basically, it wants to be able to track down your source code or any reference that you use anywhere. But the one that we're interested in now is .tags, because that's for the current code base. And what I'm going to do now is hit uh, control right square bracket. And it jumped immediately. Uh, you know, I used to have a thing. Oh, that's right. I emptied out the RC file, so now it's not displaying the name of the file at the bottom. That kind of sucks. <laughs> um, Let's cheat, and <laughs> I think this is how you get the current file name. Yes! I can't believe I got that on the first try. I'm so happy. I always have to look up what expands does. Uh, so now we're in world.rb. Where were we a second ago? I don't know. OK, so we didn't jump to a different file. Not that exciting. But it did automatically bring us to the definition of that tag. And uh, you, I'm sure, can trust that it would do that if I you know, type that uh, on something in a different file. The other interesting thing is, if you have an ambiguous tag, a tag that's defined in more than one place, uh, Vim still has your back. You can prepend that command with g. g is like the weird filler prefix. All the commands that do something slightly different have a g in front of them. It's really weird. Um, but if I say, so if I do a control right bracket, um, it brings me to 
this exact line. You can see my cursor jump. And it's kind of saying, OK, if you want to find initialize, it's right there. But if I prepend that key press with G, I get a list of every instance of initialize being defined in my entire code base, which is super cool. So that's like a global thing. Yes. Right? Yeah. And you can configure this to look just at the code base I'm using now across my entire computer. Uh, if you're truly devoted, um, I haven't stayed up late enough to do this yet, but you could conceivably configure it to know exactly which version of Ruby you're using and which bundle you're using and how to look at exactly the docs for the gem that you want. Um, Man, that'd be cool. Someone please write a plug-in for that. <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, in this case, I could just you know, pick one of the numbers and say, oh, this one's in, um, they're all in world. My code base is very boring. Uh, there we go. I want to I wanna jump to the TCP server, so I can just say 7. Can I just say 7? There we go, type number. And now I'm at the initialize method way over in my TCP file. Uh, so super cool. Not a lot of configuration required. Um, chances are C tags will be a little ornery depending on how your system is set up. Um, I think that sometime in the distant past, I set some kind of RC file that made it easy to run uh, and just use that one flag. But uh, hopefully it'll work out of the box for you too. Uh, it's a pretty neat program. Um, and Vim just knows how to read those files. So you can do quite a lot. Uh, the only other thing to cover on this um, is that you can actually uh, jump back through the tags. So if you go on a um, if you go on a hunt, if you're drilling down layer by layer and trying to figure out exactly what's going on. So let me give an example here. So tele.rb. Um, if I say, okay, uh, I guess I want to start with this world file, and then I'm going to go down and I'm learning about the code base, and you know I don't know what exit is, so I'm going to go check that out. And then I don't know what a destination is, so I'm going to see if that was defined anywhere. Okay, it wasn't. Uh, but if you do this, you can actually hit Control T, and every time you press it, it will jump back by one more tag. And it looks like it discarded my first jump, which is unfortunate. At bottom of tag step. Uh, but if you have any experience at all with like big, big code bases that have like millions of dependencies deep, uh, the Control T feature is a really nice one because you can start someplace drill down and figure out what code is doing the thing that you want to understand, and then just hammer on control T until you get back to where you started. Uh, very, uh, very convenient. Uh, OK, any questions about this one? Yeah? Does it work for CSS classes? That's a great question. I don't know off the top of my head. I bet it does by now. I bet someone's written some like C tags CSS plugin. Uh, that one actually might be easy to figure out. I think you can just say uh, C tags list languages. So it's in there somewhere. Um, I bet someone out there has done it, though. If they haven't, someone probably should. That sounds really convenient. <laughs> uh, any other questions about, uh, what are we on, tag jumping? Yeah? What strategy do you use for keeping tags in the your code base? Are running make tags repeatedly or, um, right? or I, I have a very unscientific method for that, which is um, I just leave it until I try to jump to a tag, and it goes someplace I didn't expect. And I go back and rebuild the tags, which actually isn't so bad because um, it will, C tags actually knows how to progressively update a file, and it will go through and remove non existent tags and add new ones without you having to mess around with it. So uh, it's actually a surprisingly doable approach. Um, the other way uh, I've seen is to just um, uh, bind it to your write command. So every time you save a file, it just updates the tags and then saves the file. Um, but that, I don't know. For some reason, I've just never felt good about that one. <laughs> just my, it's just my spidey sense tingling. I have no idea if it's actually onto something. Uh, good question, though. Uh, other questions before we move on? Cool. All right. Uh, let's see. Where, where are we in our sequence here? OK, so let's do, um, let's do autocomplete, and then we can take a break for pizza and hanging out, and then we'll finish out the rest of the night, if that sounds good to everybody. Uh, whoops, I disrupted the delicate balance of movement commands and scroll control. <laughs> Pay no attention to the margin behind the curtain. Uh, <laughs> okay, so uh, autocomplete, this is another one with um, possibly uh, over 600 Skrillian plugins devoted to it. Um, some of them are very, very cool. Um, the key commands for some of these things are a little weird. 
but you can also get a lot of functionality out of it. Um, so autocomplete at this point is already configured. Um, it automatically reads from your tags file if one exists. And even if it doesn't, it will automatically check out the file that you're in. And it has some language specific configuration that allows it to follow um, dependency chains. So when Vim is looking at a Ruby file, uh, someone actually sat down and wrote code so that it reads the requires at the top and it'll try and find those files. So the autocomplete functionality in Vim without any special configuration at all is already pretty nice and it's extremely configurable uh, if you decide to start using it that way. Um, very simplest by default is just control N. So if I'm typing something here and I want to do something with the contents variable, I can say at con and hit control N and it's going to automatically look through and so here are all the things that are happening inside this file and if it finds something outside the file, it'll tell me which file it comes from. Um, this menu, uh, I think this is pretty close to what it looks like out of the box. You might have to tweak it to make the font a little more legible, um, something like that. But this menu is a, a sign that you can pretty much just start using right away. And the only hotkey you need to use that is just control N. And to go backwards, you can use control P. So this one is very convenient. Uh, control P is uh, uh, previous in the list, so so cont control N oh, and control P to go back. Oh yeah. Oh cool. Yeah. Oh wait, yeah, that's that's really interesting. It reverses the order. That's neat. I like that. T I L. Um, <laughs> So uh, there are a couple of other ways to autocomplete. Um, all of the default bindings begin with control X. I have no idea why. <laughs> uh, but some of them are pretty cool. You can restrict it to this specific file only by using control X, control N. So if I say con control X, control N, uh, now you can see I only have those three options from this file. And if you look at the help for this, there is a smorgasbord of different ways you can mess with this stuff. You can complete keywords in the current file, in the dictionary, or the source, keywords in the current included files, tags, filings, anything you could possibly want. Uh, I don't remember even half of these. <laughs> the, uh, the coolest ones, I think, are these four. Control N, which is the default. It just sucks in everything according to the complete option, which is very nice and configurable, and you should totally take a look and tweak it. Um, the other one being uh, control N for just this file. And two of the other very specific ones are file names, which is a total lifesaver sometimes. So I can say um, lib tele control X control F. Now I can just insert the name of a file from that folder. All I had to do was type the folder because remember, I know Vim is in my project root. So Vim is here. So if I say lib slash tele, then Vim knows it's supposed to look inside that folder. So this is a very straightforward way of working with files. Uh, this has saved me so much time and command tabbing and copy pasting and how do I get the stupid file name? Because Vim has its own little file finder right in the insert mode. Uh, very, very cool. Could you put in an absolute tab? I bet, yeah. I don't think I've actually tried that one, but let's just do a slash and see what happens. There you go. Yeah, so you, you could do this, right? And you can just keep saying control X, control F until you find something. So yeah, uh, wow. <laughs> oh, so uh, there's probably a better way of doing this, but the way that I end up doing it all the time is uh, lib control X, control F. And then when I find the one I want, I just hit control X, control F again. Yeah. I, I have to imagine there's a better way of doing that, but I've just never had the like five minutes where I was like, I feel like looking up that particular piece of information right now. <laughs> so yeah, uh, that one's awesome. And finally, of course, uh, there's a tag only completion. So I can start with uh, control uh, uh, capital R and say control X, uh, control right bracket, which is the same thing that you hit to jump to tags. So that's actually kind of a, uh, mercifully consistent uh, interface. <laughs> but uh, that'll complete room there. Or, you know, I can say um, 
uh, CO, and if I say control X, control right bracket, it's only going to complete to connect because that's the only tag in the entire code base that it found that started with those letters. So very configurable and handy completion options in Vim. Um, this is another one where there are so many plugins and I'm just like, I don't, I can't figure out what it does that Vim can't do. Uh, but you know, the price is kind of high. You, I had to read a lot of documentation to figure this stuff out. Um, hopefully uh, this is making it a bit easier and accessible for everyone here. <laughs> because it's a shame to miss out on a feature like that. Um, okay, before we uh, jump into our mid-talk break, uh, does anyone have questions about auto-completion or lingering questions about previous topics? Yeah? Uh, just about that, you said that uh, that auto-completion will actually read like require statements in Ruby. Yeah. Um, you also work with, well, you still have Ruby as in the room, but uh, with like Node, with like import? <laughs> uh, it, it totally depends on how much monster energy drink the node guys have had recently. Yeah, like if, 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 someone, if someone happens to have made that work in the past, yeah. <laughs> um, I, I don't do enough node to know off the top of my head, but like I bet by now it probably does. Um, or there's like someone's random GitHub repo where it'll probably make it work, you know. <laughs> uh, all right, uh, other questions? Yeah? You know, I think I think I think the only way that I know of to do that is to just keep hammering until you get back to the original. Escape. Does escape work? No. Wait. Oh, yes. No, think, yeah. Okay. Oh, wait. Escape so, does work. But it took you out of insert, didn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it did. Well. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Sucks. Uh, wait. Can I do Can I do Control C maybe? I think it can do no. That, that always gives me every time I. Yeah, that's uh. Oh right, yeah, so so yeah. Here here's the extra credit bonus for the day. If someone can find in the docs how to get out of it without exiting insert mode, yeah, that's surprising that that's not uh, more widely known. I, I'm surprised I didn't know that actually. That's that's a great question. If you'd enter, uh, it just goes to the next line, I think. Control P and you go back to like the, the yeah. Left option. It's well, it selects it and then puts an enter in. Uh, continue typing like after I find something. Like, oh, oh, then actually that does get you out of it. Yeah. So uh, if I'm, but, but like you can't bail on it entirely because it'll just leave you with whatever you had. So right. if I just hit space here, like, right. yeah. Which is nice when you, you know, want that one. <laughs> uh, all right, good question. I think there was one uh, there, yeah? Does find support regular expressions? I don't know off the top of my head. I know that it supports the, uh, what's that weird term? Uh, the bash globbing with the asterisks? That's what that's called, right? Blobbing with the, yeah, okay. Uh, I don't know if it does regexes though. Um, there is a way to plug Vim's file find into the Unix find and grep commands, um, which is beyond the scope of this because I haven't done it recently, but um, I don't know if find does it out of the box. Good question though. Um, anyone else? Cool. Uh, let's take a short, I don't know, 15, 20 minute break and then we'll dive back into it. That's so cool. I'm really, I'm, I'm just, I just love that. Look at that. That's awesome. Uh, okay. So, sorry, we just had to take a minute and find a new toy to play with. Look how, look how cool that is. That's great. Uh, I'm, I'm going to do that. I'm going to try to do that instead of gesturing. Uh, I find it much less gratifying than gesturing, but, but it's probably easier for anyone who watches the video. So, um, <laughs> If anyone's curious, that is the command forward slash find the cursor feature on iTerm. I often lose mine. Uh, welcome back, everyone. I uh, hope the pizza is sitting well for you. I enjoyed mine. Um, let's dive right back in to file browsing. So uh, this one's kind of cheating because technically uh, NetRW, which is the file browser that I'm going to use, is a plugin, but it comes with Vim. Uh, by default. So I'm just going to pretend that I'm not telling you how to do things that other plugins do with this plugin. <laughs> uh, so the thing is, NetRW is, um, it's, it's effectively built in, right? Like you get it for free. That's kind of the point. Um, it's not super configurable. It's not super intuitive, but you get it for free and that's great. <laughs> um, <laughs> So uh, uh, these are some, uh, uh, excuse me, these 
are some uh, uh, options that uh, I have personally ended up using over time. Uh, they're not necessary for using NetRW, um, except for this one, which hides the horrendous banner that takes up half the screen. Um, once you have done this, though, you can simply say edit and uh, provide the name of a folder. So I'm going to say edit dot, and uh, now I have a file browser. And I can uh, expand and contract folders. Uh, it even has some nifty stuff like uh, different colors for folders and executable files. Um, you can do all kinds of crazy stuff in here, and I actually have not explored many of the features of NetRW. You can do things like attach to a remote file system through SSH. You can mark files the same way you would uh, by like control clicking um, in, in Finder, but I'm not gonna show you to do either of those things because I have no idea how to do it. I just know that you can. Uh, all I really do is just use it to browse through uh, file hierarchies visually, and you can open up things in a visual split. Um, you can open things, uh, that's with V. You can open things in a tab with T. Uh, it does all the basic things you would generally expect a file browser to do. Um, you just don't have to configure it that much or install anything to do it, which is very, very nice. Um, I'm not even sure if I had other detailed notes on this because it's kind of straightforward once you know that it's there. Um, yes, so you can uh, look at the help file netrw browse maps, and uh, that will show you a list of uh, all the different things that are mapped by default, which as you can see, it's kind of a lot. Uh, so you can do things like um, moving around, you can navigate up a directory, uh, you can hide specific things, you can create directories. It's actually pretty full featured. Um, I just... Uh, this is the one where I have never, ever blamed someone for using a plugin to do this kind of thing because NetRW is cool, it does a lot of these things, but I have just never really figured out how you're supposed to remember the commands and how they fit together. So uh, I recommend playing with this just in case your file navigation needs are simple and you just don't need another plugin anymore. Um, but be aware that like if, if this is just too ridiculous where it's just like, look at all the things it does, how do you do them in a sane, efficient way? I don't know, I'll figure it out. Like I, there's value in good documentation, and most of them has it. NetRW doesn't as much. Um, sorry if the NetRW documenter ever watches this video. I don't mean to throw any shade. Please write better documentation. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so that's my second sorry, not sorry of the talk. Uh, <laughs> but so this is pretty cool. Uh, I'm not going to spend too much time messing with it because there's just so much else to uh, talk about and... Uh, let's face it, once you've seen a file browser, you've kind of seen all of them, um, except that 3D one from Jurassic Park. That was cool. Uh, <laughs> any questions about this one? All right. Thank God. I'm not sure if I... That looks like I have the right size. Yeah, cool. Uh, okay. Uh, this next one's also uh, somewhat straightforward. This requires no outside tools whatsoever. Um, Let's say I want to make a, an empty HTML document. Uh, I'm going to show you how this one works before I explain why it works. Uh, let's close all this nonsense here. Now, uh, suppose I'm going to add a template to this file and say um, some template equals stabby thing HTML. HTML will end here. Now, I want an empty HTML template in here. Uh, what's a developer to do? Standard solutions would be um, plugin managers or, or uh, snippet managers. I might uh, write it by hand, which I did for about five years until I just couldn't take it anymore. Uh, you could copy paste from something, but so what I do is this. I say comma. Uh, can I do that thing where it shows the command I'm typing, show command? Yes. So you can see what I'm typing down there. I know it's kind of fast and not super useful, but it's better than nothing. I'm going to say comma HTML. And on the L, it's going to just blast this basic HTML template in there. And it's actually going to position my cursor in the title fields, too. Super convenient. How did I do this? Uh, it is a total mess, but it works really well. <laughs> let's, let's, let's look at this here Vim command. So. Um, this is one of those, so, so just a moment ago, I was telling you, don't necessarily bother with NetRW. It's like really big and complex and hard to figure out. Um, this is also complex, uh, apparently far more than it needs to be, probably. 
But I actually do recommend figuring this part out and, and using this because this is so much easier and straightforward compared to snippet managers once you know what the hell's going on. Um, and so that's why I'm going to take a moment to explain this as carefully and kindly as I can, uh, both for you and me, because I wrote this and I'm not exactly proud of it, but I also kind of am. So, so let's, let's look at what it does. Uh, <laughs> so uh, this, uh, this part here is just the basic mapping. Um, the no remap part is telling Vim, um, don't let any of these commands invoke themselves. So if I use, um, if I map something that's like J, uh, using no remap will make sure that it doesn't clobber or re-invoke the original use of J. Um, it's pretty much just used for paranoia here. I very much doubt there's ever going to be a built-in feature that is called comma HTML. Um, comma HTML, um, comma is really an arbitrary character that I picked uh, to prefix this weird normal mode command. Um, by the way, that's what the uh, N at the very beginning of this means. Ooh, single character highlight. Uh, that N is, stands for normal uh, because this is a mapping which will apply only in normal mode. Um, but what this means is when I type comma HTML, some people use backslash. Uh, this is often referred to as a leader character. Uh, after this comes the uh, effect of the mapping. And just as a small um, foundation explanation, if you haven't uh, written your own mapping before, if you've never seen this kind of thing, uh, you can change any key in Vim to do anything you want. It's wonderful. It's horrible. You never know if you sit down on someone else's Vim what's going to happen <laughs> when you hit any key. A any key could do literally anything. Yeah. If that doesn't just fill your heart with uh, 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 you know, thrill and terror, then you know, don't use Vim. <laughs> but so what this is doing here is this is saying uh, uh, remap, and map is just uh, you know, the term for this thing should be connected to this thing. So uh, this series of keystrokes should result in this being um, automatically typed. And so what this means is uh, when I type comma HTML, it will be as if I was sitting at the keyboard myself and typing this long string of nonsense in. Um, and what does this mean? Well, it is an invocation of the read command. And the read command does, uh, thankfully, what it sounds like. It just reads from a file into the current Vim buffer. Uh, and I'm going to really slowly show that in action because it's important to understand the difference between the read command and how we usually use Vim. Um, so what I'm going to do is go to my Vim window here. And let's see. I want to look at a list of current files. I just want to—I just want to read from some file to prove this works. So let's read from the tags file, and I'm literally just going to say colon read tags. And I'm going to tab complete. I always do this just out of paranoia in case uh, you know I'm typoing something or there's not a file where I expected it to be. When I do this, it's just going to take the contents of the tag file and blast it into the middle of this file. So read is a very straightforward but powerful command. Uh, it just means take whatever I put on the side of this and yank it into the file that I'm working with right now. The negative one uh, changes the line by one. So if I didn't have that, uh, the cursor would move when I enter the snippet. So notice I'm on this line here. And when I say comma HTML, um, there are no extra lines added except this one at the very bottom, which I think is actually part of the template for some reason. Um, but that's just a little tiny tweak. And this is the important part. So in my home directory, I have a, a Vim folder, of course. And inside there, I have this file called .skeleton.html. And I'm going to use the gf command, which uh, opens a file under the cursor to jump to that. So this is it. This is the exact contents uh, that I just pulled in by typing the snippet. So uh, we're looking at three different files now. I have my skeleton HTML file, which is uh, deep within my .files. We're looking at the actual Vim configuration file. This is what you would put into your actual Vim RC. And we're looking at the file that I have been working with, where I can now say comma HTML and pull the thing in there. Uh, the gibberish at the end, excuse me, the um, complex and carefully designed string of uh, characters. So here's the, here's the thing to know about Vim mappings. Um, I'm going to do my absolute best to explain why this works, because if, if I can explain it right, and if you can carry it with you, you can just have superpowers in Vim, because this is so cool. 
if you can get it to work. When I put this colon in the mapping, what I'm doing is I'm, uh, I'm essentially telling it to change modes. So this is a normal mode mapping, right? In normal mode, if I hit um, control N, uh, or sorry, control F, right, I'm gonna go back and forth. If I hit I, I'm gonna enter insert mode. Um, when I hit colon, I've actually changed modes. I'm no longer in normal mode, I'm in command mode. And Vim keeps really careful track of this because the keys have to do something different, right? In command mode, if I type I, I don't wanna enter insert mode, which is what would happen if I was in normal mode. I wanna type an I. So the colon is actually uh, like enter command mode. That's what that means. And the CR here, this is the special Vim specific key code for the enter key, also known as return. Uh, the CR is short for, I think, carriage return, which believe it or not, is a holdover from uh, typewriters, I'm pretty sure. Yes, it is. Yeah, uh, as well as the QWERTY layout itself. Ah, technology. <laughs> it, it moves so fast sometimes. <laughs> Uh, but so what the CR in this mapping will do is um, it literally will type. And in fact, here's, I'm just going to do this. Um, I'm going to remove this for a moment. And I'm going to reload my Vim. So I'm going to run that again. But remember, what I did here is I took away everything from the end of the HTML file and beyond. So I took away the CR. So now when I type comma HTML, look what happens. It just leaves it there as if I had typed it into command mode. So what that means is the CR is the mapping way of doing this, which is pretty neat. Once you hit enter in command mode, you're back in normal mode, which means I can type normal mode commands into the mapping again. What does 3JWF right bracket A do? Well, let's do it ourselves. 3J, what the hell was the next thing? WF open bracket A. It positions the cursor exactly in the middle of the title brackets, just for convenience, you know. So clearly, you don't have to do that part if you're making your own snippets. Uh, this is really the important part here, being able to just type in something short and instantly get the contents of a file uh, back into whatever you're working with. And this is really nice because you can just have an entire folder of snippets, and what are they? They're plain text files. You can refer to them by name. You could uh, also modify something like this um, to figure out what the uh, file name and directory is based on the name. Um, I might even do that when I get home because I just thought of that now. Why don't I do that yet? <laughs> uh, so. Uh, the interface of a snippet manager, I think, is probably the most important part, which is why, again, like, I'm not saying replace your snippet manager with this, but just knowing that this is out there is probably a nice way to keep in mind all the different things you can do if the snippet manager that you are already using or that you're thinking about using just doesn't do one thing that you were hoping for. Um, this is a very, it, right, it's like one line of code. Uh, you create the file separately, you keep track of them however you want, and you essentially can just have a folder of snippets that um, are usable whenever. And I think that's pretty rad. Uh, also, hopefully this was a useful overview of uh, how to do some cool mapping stuff. Um, I have never, I think, written a mapping correctly on the first try. I think maybe it's like hard-coded, where, where just every mapping will fail the first time you write it. I, I can't figure it out. I always have to do trial and error. So like, don't feel bad if this doesn't make sense or if you sit down and try this and it, it doesn't work because that's It'd be weird if it worked on the first try for you. <laughs> That's what I'm trying to say. Uh, these things are, uh, uh, this part I think is a real premature optimization in a sense, but like this stuff's cool. If you can figure out the whole um, colon goes into command mode, CR sends the, uh, the command automatically, then you're rolling and you can pretty much automate whatever you'd like. Um, so this is a very nice thing to have in your pocket, as you can see. Now we can take over the world with much fewer keystrokes because that's always super important. <laughs> yes? Yeah, probably. Yeah. <laughs> the, yeah, so that, if anyone didn't hear that question, was just could I just have done a forward slash search? Probably. Um, 
for some reason, I just like using the word commands. I don't know. They feel really cool to me. It's like five words. That's awesome. How can a computer know what a word is? That's great. I don't know. <laughs> it blows my mind. <laughs> Sometimes, usually. <laughs> oh, uh, I guess, was, uh, were there any questions about this first? Yeah? I have, uh, yeah. A lot of the, the uh, snippet managers, they do, I, I guess there, there's kind of a combination of auto complete, but like, say, I type D in Ruby, I type D, yeah. And with Neo, it's like, and I hit, like, control K, yeah. it then gives me a template for a, uh, a method definition. Yes. Can you, is this, a, like, can you, can you leverage this to accomplish that? So, uh, a great question. So that question was, um, uh, certain snippet managers or even just editors will set you up to type in an entire method uh, as soon as you say DEF, and uh, the answer is absolutely yes. Um, there is actually, I think it's called abbreviations, possibly, is the name of the feature, where it can pay attention to the stuff you're typing in insert mode, and when it sees you type a certain pattern, then it can run a command. Um, so I think that uh, I think it's like it can do exactly that. It's just that it's Vim, so it doesn't do all that out of the box. You have to, you know, open up your VimRC and figure out, you know, exactly what it looks like and how you want it to work. Uh, unless you get lucky and someone else happens to have it in theirs. <laughs> uh, I, I think actually in my VimRC is something like that for Python, where it takes essentially all of the um, names of the variables that you pass into the initializer and turns them into the like at manager equals manager at this equals whatever because I hate typing those things out. <laughs> and is it then like, you like tap through those, those variables as well? Uh, no, because it's just my little janky VimRC script. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, uh, you know, I, I have affection for it as a result, so. Uh, good question. Any other questions on uh, snippets? If, if you can call these that, and I do? All right, awesome. <laughs> uh, okay, so, uh, this last one is probably um, one of the more interesting ones. It, it's. I think that the build integration plugins today are very strong and you should use them instead of this because the support for this ebbs and flows, I think, with like the time of day recently. Um, but I'm going to show it to you anyway because it's really cool and uh, I am selfishly hoping that someone will sit down and uh, reteach Vim how to work with this stuff. Or actually, in this case, uh, reteach RSpec how to output in a Vim readable format. It used to be able to do that and it doesn't anymore. I guess because uh, same as all the rest of this stuff. People just kind of forget that Vim does that. So what I'm going to do here is um, a three-step process because I have this um, I have this window running here where I can say bundle exec rspec and when I do that um, I'm going to have my documentation style output in this particular uh, carefully curated series of tests. I have two that are currently failing. Uh, but Vim can't read this. We need to add something that will allow Vim to do that. And through some uh, careful Googling, I stumbled on a blog post from one Philip Bradley who has a simple Ruby class called Quick Fix Formatter, which you can pass to RSpec, and it will change the way that RSpec outputs errors. So when I run RSpec, uh, I can say format uh, documentation, which is what gives us the stuff we just saw. Uh, I can do the classic progress, which shows you the dots, which have been scrolled off, I think. Yeah, so you can do the dot approach. Or I can pass it this special quick fix formatter. And uh, the exact way that I plugged this into uh, RSpec is that I literally just copy pasted it from that guy's blog post into my spec helper.rb. I think the ethical way of doing this would be to give it its own file and include that, but you know, whatever. I just wanted to get it done. Uh, <laughs> I don't have time to make things work better. I got work to do. Uh, so if I if I do this, uh, it just outputs the errors, and it uses this sort of uh, three-part format where it's like here's the file, and here is the line number on where on which the uh, error happened, and here's the actual error message itself. Um, this is the classic Vim quick fix format, uh, which came from I think the way that uh, the original C compiler. Um, allowed output for some of its own uh, error messages. The thing is, when I do this, if I have it set up this way, I can mess with this weird secret option. It's not really secret, but I've never seen it used anywhere, <laughs> called uh, make perg, which I am hoping is short for make program. Uh, and I can 
do this strangely necessary backslash escape thing on the spaces. Don't ask me why it needs that on this one option. I have no idea. But I can essentially just give it the same command that I was just typing into, um, into my command line window. And now when I run Vim's built-in make command, let's do this here. Uh, let's pretend I'm actually editing some real code so I can say lines uh, TCP, there we go. So if I say make now, I can see the output from that command. But when I get back into Vim, I have this line here that says one of two. Because what Vim did is it read that output and it detected that there were two lines and that it was in valid quick fix format. And it figured out that uh, these are the two messages. So here is that actual uh, text message which describes the error. And it will just bring me directly to where it exploded. And I can actually use the commands cn and cp uh, for next and previous to navigate through all of my test failures. I can even say cl for a list. And uh, the final command that I always use for this is cc, which lets you jump to a specific one. Kind of useless since we only have two, but I can type cc2 and it will jump directly to that error. Um, so this is another one of those things where like, uh, the plugins will do such an awesome job, they'll open up your tests in a separate window and allow you to view them side by side and all the nice bells and whistles. But if you just want to get some basic functionality like this, um, this is all you need. Plug this one weird thing into your RSpec, plug this one weird thing into Vim, and suddenly it can understand your test output. Uh, which is very handy. Um, this kind of thing has absolutely saved me tons of time because honestly, like, I have a short attention span. When I run something like this, the, the like, six months that it takes me to be like, what, I don't, what line, is this even the right, like, is it that, I don't, 17? Does that mean there's 17 errors? I, I have no, like, it's just, it's, it's too much for me. I'm, I'm lazy and I have ADHD and just, I want to just be able to say, you know, next one, show me the next error. Uh, jump right to it. This is super cool. Uh, and if this looks like the kind of thing that will help you out, then I certainly hope uh, this also works when you plug it into your VimRC. <laughs> As that is never quite a guarantee. Um, all right, uh, that's all I got for this one. I think that might be, is that our last big, uh, yeah, okay. So let's, uh, let's do some questions on this, if there are any, and then, uh, yeah. Oh, that. yeah. And I tried to use some of the built-ins, but I, al I always, after Googling it, I, find, I always find myself just going back and fighting stuff. It's, shell, yeah, it's, it's one of those things where, like, if you're lucky, it works out of the box. Yeah. If not, it could take you anywhere from one day to one year to stumble on just the right series of incantations and configuration variables. Um, so the, for anyone who didn't hear, the question is, um, recovering file. Oh, man. All right, well, it looks like you got something. Why? <laughs> I'm sorry you had to see that. It's not even submitting yet. How long does it take to get... Get out of here. It's ridiculous. <laughs> They're like, oh, God. That's the Vim Tmux. If your geolocation is in New York City bug. I've seen stranger bugs. Uh, so, sorry, before we were so uh, uh, surprisingly um, redirected there, uh, the question was, refresh my memory? Copy-pasting, copy -pasting, yes. Uh, so the question was, uh, copy-pasting, how do? Um, the question was much more nicely phrased than that. <laughs> If it works, if it works out of the box, um, you can use the plus register. Uh, if you're not familiar with Vim registers, there's more than one clipboard. There's the default register, which if I just say dd to delete the line, it goes into the default register, also called the uh, double quote register. If I select a different register uh, using the double quote command, I can say uh, delete this into register A. Uh, and then I can say delete this into register B. And then I can say paste from A, paste from B. We're having a great time. 
Um, but there are some very special use registers, uh, one of which is the plus register. Um, I think that it's the plus and the asterisk register which connect to the system clipboard. So uh, I don't know if it works out of the box on mine right now. Let's see if it does. Uh, it has to be compiled. Yeah. Double quote plus double Y. So did that work? Let's see if it worked. Command V. Yeah, see? So I copied from my Vim into the system clipboard. Uh, that's cool. I'm, I'm not going to talk about how much time I may or may not have spent making that work. If you use iTerm 2, there's a checkbox in preferences that allows you to iTerm to access the system clipboard from the system. Next month, I'll just do an entire hour long talk of how to make your system clipboard work on various different systems. <laughs> It's, this is one of those things where it's like, it, it shouldn't be hard. It really just should not be difficult. But like, no matter how many times I get fed up and I'm like, I'm, I'm like a big cool software developer, I could figure out how to actually make this work. This is ridiculous. And then like six hours later, I'm, I'm just like drenched in sweat and I'm miserable. And I'm like, it's, it's so hard. Like, yeah, yeah. And it's, it's one of those real talk moments where they're like, why doesn't this work? And, and, and you're just like, look, I'm sorry. Like, <laughs> it shouldn't be this way, but it is. It's, it's software development. Like, I'm so sorry. <laughs> but you just cannot copy paste right now. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I wish I had a one-liner answer for that one. But uh, if someone else stumbles on it, please let me know. <laughs> because I would love to spread that knowledge. Um, all right, excellent question. Uh, anyone else? Yeah? Is there a way to do templates like you're doing a shell script and it just knows like it, like like uh like if I did a snippet thing but it would use environment variables and stuff to just fill it in? Yeah. Oh, there's got to be a way. I couldn't tell you off the top of my head. Um, I might almost just like run an external bash script and read that in um, because you, you can do that. It's just a question of like keeping track of all those moving parts. You know, I think that's really one of the toughest parts of Vim is just that it has a lot of subsystems that do a lot of different things. Um, that's a good question, though. Uh, uh, if anyone didn't hear that question, was just uh, could you do templates with environment variables and filling things in? And I'm positive you could, but I wouldn't know off the top of my head. It probably would look a little bit like the thing that I did um, with the HTML. Yeah. So, uh, are there any plugins that you use? Yes. Um, I actually am going to talk about that, but I'm going to leave that for the end. Okay. Excellent question. <laughs> uh, anyone else? Cool. All right. So um, before my closing outro, that's what that's called, right? <laughs> I just wanted to talk for a, a quick second about two very important things. Uh, important thing number one, um, this is mostly tangential, this talk, but it's really not because everyone who uses Vim should do this all the time. Use the help system. Use the help system. Use the help system. It's so good. It is so strong and uh, uh, incredibly configurable. Not even configurable, just, just I'm going to show you what I'm talking about. If I want to know what the control N key does, either out of curiosity or because I know that it's related somehow to what I want to do, there are key codes for all the different special characters that you can use. The most common one is control, and its character code is the upper caret. Yes. <laughs> um, if I just say help control N, uh, it's going to show me what control N does in normal mode. Right, so it counts N lines downward. Okay, cool. But what if I want to see what it does in a different mode? You can do that also. You can say help I underscore, which means show me what the following command does in insert mode. Control N. Now find next match for words. So this is the autocomplete keyword that we used before. What does it do in command mode when I'm typing here in the command line? C underscore control N. So you can look up any command in any mode just by prefixing it with that uh, mode number, um, mode letter underscore. Uh, the other most useful thing that I know of is help grep. It does exactly what it says in the tin. It greps or searches through every help document it can find. So I can just say help grep windows. And it will find every single, it found 587 matches for Windows. And I can use that exact same quick fix list from before, CN, CP, CL, uh, to just look through every instance of the regular expression uh, Windows in the entire manual. 
So if you can even think of a vague phrase that might have something to do with what you're trying to figure out, then you can use help grep to jump there uh, or find any possible instance of it. Um, if you want to just browse this stuff, just type in colon help and hit enter. And this is such a nice and friendly man page compared to a lot of what you'll see elsewhere. Um, it just shows you most of the stuff that I just went over um, down here. And it will tell you how to navigate, how to jump through, how to jump back, um, how to get help on specific things. It shows you all the mode keys. So just to, if there's like one thing that you ever just individually take the time to peruse, um, let it be the main help screen because it will make you so much faster all the rest of the time. Um, you won't even have to Google anymore uh, unless you're dealing with something real hairy. So that's super important thing number one. Um, do you want to have questions about this or just like want to scream out loud, wow, that's so awesome? I do that all the time. Yeah? I usually read it. It crashed again. It, the crash gatherer crashed. All right. Um, <laughs> we're into the bonus now, so, you know, online viewers will just uh, have to deal. I'm very sorry. Uh, really? Uh, um, so the question was, uh, what's the best way to view this stuff? Um, I think that one's probably up to personal preference. I don't mind looking at stuff in a terminal screen, and I really like being able to do, for example, uh, so I can say, oh, I want to jump to this, and I can use the actual uh, tag feature, control right bracket, and jump to help summary. And if I want help on something else, and it says, you can see user guide topics uh, in this file, and I can just jump to that file. If I'm done reading, I can jump back with control O. So now I'm back to the first file where I started. That's really cool. Um, it's just not as fast to do that on a web browser, just because you know, you'll have to find the link to click with the mouse and I don't know that kind of stuff adds up for me or at least it feels like it does um, but if it's easier for you to read this stuff in a browser or I don't know print it out and highlight it like a book I kind of want to do that now uh, you should do that because the important thing isn't like that you do it exactly the way I'm doing it but just like give yourself access to the docs um, there's so much good stuff in there reading through the docs is how I found all of this stuff some of it I had to really search for but some of it I just stumbled on and I was like wait it just does this that's awesome what and, and if you give yourself as many opportunities as you can manage to have moments like that, um, your journey through Vim uh, will really benefit from that because there's an awful lot just hiding right under the surface uh, to be found, I think. Uh, very good question. Others? Yeah? X mode? Y? X mode. Which one is that? Is that uh, X mode? I forget what in the world X mode is for. I mean, it's, it's kind of like, oh, God. <laughs> Lord, give me the strength. Yeah, it's, it's there to keep you on your toes, I guess. Like just, in case you felt like you'd achieved a state of flow, there's X mode. Right, just, uh, yeah, I, I can remember a single time when I did something with X mode but I cannot remember what in the world it was I did or why. So I, I got nothing. <laughs> like string substitution, like if you're familiar with set, you can actually like run a set expression on the current buffer. Oh. So you can like replace, find or replace it. Huh. Okay. Yeah, All right. Cool. Yeah. So it, it does something. <laughs> not, not one of my favorite modes, I have to say. <laughs> yeah. 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 I, I'm, I, I'm not using my default VimRC, but I'm pretty sure I've done that finally in my, my main one. <laughs> um, uh, okay, uh, other questions? These are fantastic questions, by the way. Cool. All right. Um, important thing number two, uh, plugins to use. So I do, in fact, use plugins. Let's see, if I open my regular VimRC, is it going to be legible here? Let's find out. That's all right. So my VimRC is huge. Um, I've, it's like 10 years old now. <laughs> I, I alternate between, like much of the material in this talk, I alternate between being super proud and slightly embarrassed by it. <laughs> um, the plugins I do use, I use Vundle, um, not because I have any particular attachment to it, but because it was the first thing that I stumbled on and I haven't had any issues with it. Um, what I will do is I have this sort of section of my VimRC where 
uh, I give every single plugin its own little um, fold where I can add um, multiple plugins that are related or uh, add some configuration that's plugin specific. Uh, but if you uh, look down my list of plugins that I use, they're all extremely specific. Uh, they're all pretty small, um, with the exception, I think, maybe of NerdTree, which is the file browser that I do use. Um, but this is like Vim Elixir, Vim Tmux, uh, Vim Ruby here doc syntax. That's literally so that I can open up a whatever.rb file and say HTML equals this, and then like put HTML in there, and it will highlight it correctly. That's the entire purpose of that plugin. Um, so it's like, it's just it's really small. Uh, I forget if that's a plugin that I wrote. <laughs> I have no idea. Um, that's I don't know. Let's find out. Is it? No. Thank you, Joker one thousand and seven. <laughs> I, I, it's it's really cool. I can you can just add other things. If I put Hamel, it'll highlight Hamel. Like that's so neat. Um, <laughs> so uh, really, they're all pretty low here. Uh, they're all pretty small here. Uh, the um, uh, obviously, I use like all of Tim Pope's plugins. <laughs> you may be the first humans other uh, than me to lay eyes on that particular line. I'm, I'm kind of proud of that one. Uh, but you know, I use his surround thing, so you can do the like change from single to double quotes, like that kind of nonsense. Um, Tim Pope makes a lot of really nice small uh, targeted plugins that uh, make them a little bit more of a joy to use. Uh, but yeah, I mean, that's that's pretty much what I do for plugins. Um, if I am doing something and I just need like a tweak where it's like, okay. Um, it's not syntax highlighting mustache and handlebars, or I want to be able to um, correctly indent CoffeeScript. Uh, sorry, no, that's uh, React files. There's there's like there's a plugin for that. So I try to keep them pretty small. Um, that's basically how I use plugins. Uh, like I said before, I do use where's the big one? There it is. I do use NerdTree, um, which I have configured a little bit. Uh, but that's I think the only like big plugin that I use. Um, I've used a few others over over time, but I don't know. Uh, none of them have really stuck. I'm not even like super happy with NerdTree. I mean, it's it's awesome. Like I I don't think that I could make a better NerdTree than NerdTree. Uh, but like it's I'm just very I'm very uh, dependency averse when it comes to my tool set. And uh, one of the reasons that I tried to stay as neutral as possible for most of this talk is because I know I'm biased towards like don't use plugins. Uh, but you should. <laughs> so I don't use many of them, but I use Vim pretty idiosyncratically, even for Vim users. So don't look at this and feel like you have to uh, make sure that there are no plugins longer than like 500 lines or something. Like, don't, don't worry about it. If a plugin makes your life easier, use it, um, for sure. Uh, I think, yeah, that was my second other important thing, right? Let's have anything else here? Yeah, all right. Uh, so unless there are other questions... Uh, all right, that's uh, that's all I got. Thank you so much for joining me. This was a pleasure. Um, let me go through my little outro here. Uh, I have the slides available on GitHub. <laughs> I also, um, also just for convenience, I put the uh, Ruby quick fix formatter there in case you're interested. Um, I mostly post kitten pictures and complain about things on Twitter, if that's your kind of thing. <laughs> uh, I'm also uh, taking on clients and students and possibly looking for full-time work. So. If you uh, know anybody who needs a tutor to learn Ruby or Vim or Python or web development, if you need someone to do internal training, um, or if you're just looking for a uh, dev or PM, get in touch. We can chat. Um, worst case scenario, we get to have lunch and hang out, and that's always fun. But that's all I got. Thank you again so much. Um, thanks very much. <laughs>